Chapter 3 of Adventures of the Infallible Godal by Frederick Irving Anderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night of a Thousand Thieves Tucked away toward the apex of the island at the battery are a few irregular city blocks over which the figure of sleep seems to hover with a finger on her lips. The stillness that falls here when the day's work is done is sepulchral. To the west is lower Broadway, feebly sensuous even in the small hours, a thin stream of cars and the occasional rumble of the underground still evidencing that the line of life linking two days is not yet broken. To the north is Newspaper Row, glowing with its perpetual flame of eternal wakefulness, functioning stridently at the approach of dawn when only the cock should be crowing. To the east is the river, gleaming with the arching lights of the bridges, dull with the shadows of silent looming ships and creeping barges, turning to and fro sluggishly with the tide. It is drowsing, but it does not sleep. A winch rattles. The exhaust of a straining engine breaks a blank wall of darkness, and a blinding beam of intense electric blue breaks through the dull shadows of a freight house to show that labor still strains and sweats even at the darkest hour. The heart is slow, but it still pulses. The city never sleeps, except here in this tiny triangle, an inverted triangle, its base the lane where the greatest jewelers in the world are massed, its apex the street, the financial vortex of the nation, where fortunes change hands every minute. Here, where life is at its highest tension during daylight hours, it is as silent as death now, its towering facades of marble, granite, and sandstone as dull as some long-forgotten city. A footfall among the long shadows starts a hollow song of echoes. A policeman, drowsing against some grill, lets fall his club, and the rattle is like the roar of artillery. No wheel is stirring, no human being abroad, except the slouching night watchmen gossiping together in some dark arch in whispers. Within a stone's throw on each hand are riches beyond definition, beyond the power of a mint to duplicate. Here are cold vaults of gold and storehouses of jewels so rare that guardians of flesh and blood have been swept aside and intricate, unerring mechanism installed in their stead. Hidden wires, as sensitive as raw nerves, creep hither and yon to every corner into honeycombs of cells encased with concrete, steel, and live steam. 1. Officer 004 was sorrowfully executing a vamp on the tessellated pavement of the corridor of the International Life Building, interjecting syncopations with snaps of his fingers to the tune of meditation that was running through his head. It was a cruel task for a young man to be condemned to the very silences of these ghoulish defiles. All must serve, but some must stand and wait. To stand and wait with majestic uplifted finger in the maelstrom of 34th Street and 5th Avenue was one thing. To haunt a graveyard that could not even boast a rabbit was quite another, and not at all in keeping with the dignity he had absorbed from his book of rules when he was presented with his shield and heard his chief depicting the glory of his calling. Occasionally a night watchman in heretical gray slunk by, but it is more simple to extract blood from a stone than companionship from one of these low-caste civilians. At this hour even the nocturnal scrub women had long since put on their shoes and gone home. At the lower end of his beat, toward the river, dwelt the one human being whom Officer 004 could cultivate consistently through the six weary hours of his watch. That was Long John, the hot dog man, whose steaming kettle of frankfurters simmered plaintively through the hours of the night, inviting passing sailormen or spelling night toiling longshoremen. Stealthily, the whisking feet of the policeman wiped the pavement of the corridor to the tempo of his snapping fingers as he meditated on the sorrows of life and the lonesomeness of death. Suddenly, the resonant air of the ghoulish defiles was smitten with the bang-bang of an automobile exhaust. Now an automobile in itself was as welcome a sight to our policeman as a sportive whale to a ship in the doldrums. But an automobile that came to a jarring standstill with a squealing of brakes 
jammed on by no tender hand, suggested not only an event, but an adventure. The quick brain of our officer noted, furthermore, from the gloom of his corridor, that this car came to a stop on the left side of the street, hard against the curb. Rule number 26, in the little blue book he carried buttoned inside his blouse, stated plainly that such an offense against well-seasoned traffic rules is punishable by fine or imprisonment or both. However, from the look of things, and particularly from the sounds that emerged from the two passengers, this automobile was enjoying rare good fortune to be able to come to a stop at all, regardless of the rules of the road. When the muffler of the engine suddenly blew its head off with a loud bang, the car was sliding down the incline in the canyon that dumps Nassau Street into the hollow that was once, in the long ago, a meandering brook flanked by a romantic cow path, still known by the name of Maiden Lane. Our officer brought his vamping feet to a standstill and exercised his discretion. He might vary the monotony, establish a reputation for himself, in fact, by bringing in a prisoner from this solemn spot which slept with both eyes shut at night. But, he reflected, the misdemeanor was just round the corner from the confines of his beat, and was therefore the concern of his partner, Mulligan, who was not in sight. Also, tomorrow was his day off, and he must choose, and choose quickly, between going to court and going fishing. He decided in favor of the latter, as the season was well advanced, late October, and weak fish would be migrating at the first opportunity. He tinctured his decision with the reflection that traffic rules are made solely for traffic, a condition that obviously did not exist at the moment, and therefore rule number 26 would never know the difference if it were not called into use for the present emergency. The decision was proved especially happy by what followed. Evidently his new friends were in for quite a stay, at least it appeared they would tarry to keep him company until his relief arrived. Strange noises were emerging from the engine, even now after the pistons had come to a halt. One of the passengers dismounted with much difficulty on account of a greatcoat. He stretched himself, yawned, and divested himself of his greatcoat, and then carefully picked out the sharply corrugated surface of a manhole cover as the couch on which he might rest while he made astronomical observations under the car. Why a man should pick out a manhole cover, sharply corrugated in the first place, was beyond the wit of our officer. Why the man should strike a match to examine the manhole cover to be sure that he had the right one was another rather asinine trick. This person was at length satisfied, for he rolled over on his back and with much exertion because of his girth, worked himself under the chassis. Our officer, seeking companionship, softly resumed his vamp and propelled himself toward the stalled car and its horizontal mechanician. The passenger in the seat was enveloped in bearskins to his chin. His chin was shrouded with a truly Bismarckian mustache, and a pair of obsolete goggles bridged the gap between the bow of the mustache and the peak of the cap. He looked exactly like the cartoons of motorists before the days of windshields. At sight of the sculling policeman, the man in bearskins mechanically began exploring the depths of his furs and produced therefrom two cigars, one of which he handed without a word to the officer. The other he applied to the recesses of his mustache, igniting the tip with a pocket lighter, which evidently he carried palmed for such occasions. He nodded a greeting to the policeman and watched with some curiosity as Officer 004 deftly transferred the cigar to the crown of his helmet. "'Here's another for your brother,' said the man in bearskins, producing another cigar, and our policeman, not at all nonplussed by the windfall, sent this second offering to join the first. "'Break down,' said the policeman, by way of opening a vein of sympathy and understanding. His words seemed for the first time to awaken the man under the engine to a consciousness of his presence, for the man below, himself enveloped in goggles, thrust out his head. "'No,' said the man under the car. Not a breakdown. We are sewer inspectors, testing manholes. The policeman readily traced the source of this wit to the waffle-like manhole cover on which the man lay prostrate and smiled indulgently. He could while away the remaining few minutes of his watch giving advice. In these days of foolproof motors with needle valves, butterfly shutters, and tubes so placed that they can be doctored from above instead of below, the sight of a horizontal motorist was becoming rare, even in the barbershop papers. Nineteen seven, 
Harkamer, said the policeman to himself scornfully, taking note of the hub. Once before he became an officer, he had begun a correspondence course in automobile engineering, and he had progressed so far that he was able to classify machines according to the cryptic designs of their hubs. That was long ago. A motorist of today, who was so far put to it that he drove a Herkimer of 1907 model, must be far put to it indeed. "'Don't mind my friend,' said the man in bearskins, contentedly drawing at his cigar. "'He has been sitting up all night with his sick car, and it is getting on his nerves. Do you happen to have the correct time, officer?' It lacked five minutes of the hour of two. This seemingly innocent fact caused quite a commotion between the two motorists, and for a moment they argued in lively fashion back and forth. The only thing they agreed on was that their respective watches differed by three minutes and ten seconds of eternal time, as indicated by the policeman's timepiece. Indeed, the exactness of the hour seemed of such importance to these two, apparently hung up for the rest of the night with their sick car, that the obliging officer ran across the street to verify his faith in his own timepiece by a jeweler's chronometer ticking away in the half-shadow of a barred window. When he returned, the man in furs had submerged himself to the ears in his great collar, and only the lazily winking cigar protruding from the enveloping folds gave signs of life. The policeman squatted on his heels and held matches in close proximity to the gasoline feed, while the man underneath sweated and swore but did not remove his goggles. Then came the welcome clatter of a distant nightstick on the pavement, as strident as a drumbeat, and Officer 004 took his leave gracefully and made his way toward the river with light foot. His relief was calling. His day off had begun. His head was full of fish. He did not once glance round. Had he done so, he might have seen the head of the man in furs emerge from its enshrouding collar and turn cautiously. The man lifted a heavy instrument which looked like a pair of bloom shears, but might have been an automobile jack, and set it down on the pavement beside the car. Then he waited for thirty seconds. At the end of that time, apparently unmindful of his mechanician, he touched the button of an up-to-date starter. The engine purred softly, and the car slid away as easily as if coasting downhill instead of uphill, for the car turned into the upgrade of Maiden Lane to Broadway, and then north. The hollow silence shut down again. The canyon was deserted. Only the manhole cover now marked the spot where, five minutes before, Providence had presented Policeman 004 with two cigars against his day off on the banks. A two hours' wink on his cot in the dormitory would fortify our sportsman for the pleasures of the day ahead, so he reflected, as he divested himself of his shoes and belt and lay down to lull himself to sleep, with the problem of whether the weather would be more propitious for shrimps than bloodworms as bait. But it was not to be. Later in his career, Officer 004 more than once used the incident of this morning to drive in his lessons to the rookies who came his way, that a patrolman of the first grade must on no account exercise his discretion. Discretion is all right for captains, or even for lieutenants, on occasions, but the little blue book states clearly what a patrolman must do under certain circumstances. Rule number 26 covers the case in point. If our policeman had done his duty as he saw it, he would have jugged those two night birds and appeared in court at the break of day to witness against them for violating the rules of the road. The judge would have listened to three words. Ten dollars, he would have said, and with fair winds blowing, policeman 004 might have caught the eight o'clock boat and the nine o'clock train to Huguenots and had his play with a fish in spite of himself. Traffic rules are traffic rules, even in Nassau Street at two in the morning. The superiority of bloodworms, in spite of the price, had won the debate, when suddenly the slumbers of Officer 004 were interrupted by a crashing clamor that seemed to jar the very plaster of the room. It was followed instantly by the thumping of stockinged feet falling off the forests of cots. Sharp cries and indistinct commands burst in through the door of the drill room. A volley of musketry, which seemed to come from the street, told the sleepy senses of the fishermen that the automobile reserve wagon was waiting with noisy impatience at the curb. He fell into his shoes, scooped up his belt, his club, his revolver, and his helmet, and joined the rush to the front room. He was buckling on his belt, as he said here, to the roll call. He was buttoning his blouse, as he stumbled on the heels of the man ahead of him in the double trot to the street. 
He was climbing into the green wagon that holds forty men on a pinch and takes them where they want to go at forty miles an hour, if necessary, when he discovered that he had tipped his precious cigars out of his helmet. Cedar Street, straight across, William the Broadway, remember, a solid line, not a man to pass, someone was shouting to the lieutenant who swung on the footboard. And they were off round the first corner at a gate that threatened to capsize them. At William, the police wagon began spilling policemen as peas rolling out of a pod. Officer 004 tumbled out at Nassau, and his feet struck to the pavement where they struck. That was orders. Not a man was to pass. Every twenty feet stood a policeman, trying his best to gather his still slumbering wits and to make head or tail out of the situation. There was not the familiar sting of smoke in the air that usually accounts for such a midnight upheaval. Neither was the clang of the police wagon to be heard on all sides now, met by the answering wail of fire truck sirens, that strange wail which in the dead of night is like nothing so much as the howl of a panther with its head buried in some mud cavern. But bells, 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 everywhere the angry clang of bells. Fast, slow, whimpering, booming, they shiver the early morning air with their insistent clamor. First precinct reserves, close order, forward, double quick came the bellowing order of a megaphone from the Broadway end, and the men closed up and started forward on a run. At Broadway they were shunted to the north, at Maiden Lane they were dropped twenty feet apart east to William. "'Not a man to pass!' roared the megaphone, and its echoes had scarcely died away when a little police automobile sped up and came to a stop. Two men got out. One was the inspector of the district. The other was a man in civilian's clothes. He was roaring at the top of his voice. How mo who said the lane? Number three cable is gone now. Throw this line across Fulton Street. And before the blown reserves could get their breath, they were bellowed into double quick again and shot up Broadway another eighth of a mile. As they were thrown cross town at Fulton Street, they were met by the advance line of scouts from Park Row. Emergency reporters panting, some of them without hats or coats in the rush of the moment of alarm. You can't get through, said the lieutenant, running forward to meet them. Instantly there was the flashing of silver stars and reporters' police cards, the sesame by which the press crowds to the front row of the thrillers that are staged every hour of the day and night in this city of five million souls. "'I don't give three whoops if you're the angel Gabriel. You can't get through. Them's orders,' roared the lieutenant, and he reached out and caught one daring fellow by the collar and sent him spinning to the gutter. "'Here's a man through from the other end,' cried one of the angry reporters. They all turned. A young man, his ulster flapping in the wind, was running toward them. "'You can't pass!' cried the lieutenant, barring his way. "'Who says I can't? Inspector Wiegand put me through at John Street. Take your hands off me. What the devil is the matter with you mutts, anyway? Every reserve south of 42nd Street is here, and you've got a line strung solid around twenty blocks, and there isn't a man among you with wit enough to know what's happened. Gad! Look at that!' His last exclamation was caused by a sudden bursting into light of the tall towers of the international life. One by one the floors counted themselves, as some hand threw on the current at the electric switch. Then a neighboring building began to wink light through its windows, then another, and another. The Wall Street and Maiden Lane district was opening its eyes wide in the dead of night. The shiny pavement was flooded with reflection. The dull sky overhead caught the glare and threw it back as a luminous cloud. In the Pearl Street converting station, the Edison superintendent sprang from his couch at the clang of a warning bell and ran to the switchboard. The needle of the dial he looked at was jumping toward a thousand amperes at a time. The lone set of converters carrying for the night load south of Canal Street was as hot to the touch as a flat iron under the stress of a sudden excess of electric current. The superintendent threw in one machine after another at the giant switchboard. The needle had now touched the index of the peak of the load, the normal capacity of the electric service to be had from this station. "'Who the devil is celebrating at this hour?' he exclaimed, glancing over at the clock. It lacked five minutes of three. He ran up a flight of iron steps to a balcony hanging on the side of the south wall and peered out of the window. The skyscraper line of the lower part of the island was like a huge heap of glittering yellow jewels. Every window to the topmost of the towers was aglow with light. 2. 
At seven o'clock on that momentous October morning, which was always afterward referred to by the Edison superintendent as the time we hit the peak of the load with a jump of 4,000 amps at 3 a.m., and by Officer 004 as the day I did not go fishing. At seven o'clock that morning, the cordon of police was still being drawn tight across Fulton to William, down William to Pearl, down Pearl to the spot where it crosses Broadway for the second time in that street's crooked career through lower New York, and up Broadway to meet the start of the line at Fulton. Gradually, however, the excitement focused itself at a point in Dutch Street, where the new manufacturing jewelers building stands, a stone's throw from Maiden Lane. This building is the last work in the art of safety devices as applied to fire and burglar hazard. It is absolutely unburnable, they say. Dizzy Sunday story specialists have attempted to compute the wealth in gold and precious stones that finds its way into this tall skyscraper, given over entirely to manufacturing jewelers, in the course of a year. A knowledge of logarithms is necessary in the calculation. Knights of the road occasionally stop on the opposite side of the street and look with longing eyes at the tall façade, every window of which seems to nod an invitation. Usually these gentlemen, if they stand too long in one spot, are tapped on the shoulder by total strangers and requested to move on, back, not forward. The old deadline, relic of the days of a great policeman, has long since passed into history as a police institution in the Maiden Lane district. The public did not take to the idea of a squad of plainclothes police telling a man in which direction he might walk the free streets of the city, no matter what the record of the man might be. But the association of jewelers themselves, recognizing the value of the old deadline, have always maintained it at their own expense. At seven in the morning, two squads of men, one of police and the other of gray-coated specials, Getting no response to repeated knocking of the big bronze gate that closed the corridor in the night time, set to work with sledges and jacks and soon had the gate open. Their fears were doubled by the fact that the din occasioned by the battering did not bring the body of watchmen who guarded this building during every hour of the day and night. The building was fully illuminated like the rest, showing that some hand had manipulated the switch at the first alarm. Next they attacked the inside doors. These proved to be more easily negotiable. On the floor in front of the elevator cage they found the captain of the night watch bound and gagged, an ugly streak of dried blood matting his hair and covering his forehead. He was released, but he was found to be in so serious a condition that it was necessary to transfer him at once to Governor Hospital. Inside an elevator the rescue party found two more of the watch bound together back to back all but unconscious from the choking effect of ligatures around their necks. They had been chloroformed and were still in so dazed a condition that they could throw little light on the situation. Indeed, later their sole knowledge appeared to be that they had been suddenly set on, overpowered and bound. They had seen nothing. The captains of the two squads telephoned their chiefs at once. They had found the storm center. Deputy Burns of the police was a former Secret Service man, drafted into the city service because of his knowledge of crime and criminals. Captain Dunstan of the private corporation, the burglar alarm system that was living a night of history, had been one of the deputy's chief aides in the government work, and he possessed, in addition to a knowledge of crime and criminals, a technical skill that had enabled him to perfect a burglar alarm system believed by experts to be absolutely invulnerable. And now, at this moment, the vaunted mechanism was a tangle of useless wires. Three of the main cables had been cut, and at the moment that Officer 004 was tumbled out of bed by the riot call, the indicators on the sensitive burglar alarm switchboard in John Street, if they were voracious, reported the astounding fact that over 1,700 safes were being tampered with at the same moment. 1,700 strong boxes bulging with wealth were shrieking for help. Not exactly at the same moment, however, for the cunning thief had cut the cables with intervals of one minute between, first the lead-enclosed chief carrying nearly five hundred pairs of wires, the sensory nerves of the rich vaults lying below Cedar Street. At the deafening persistent clang of that first alarm, the authorities, dumbfounded at the extent of the catastrophe, had thrown their cordon of police around this small district, drawing it so tight that it seemed no man could escape. 
Then with a crash, the switchboard of District Number 2 went to pieces, and in another 60 seconds, District Number 3 added its bells to the bedlam. Then it was that the police lines were moved as far north as Fulton, and the call was sent forth for all reserves south of 125th Street. Burns and Dunstan, summoned from opposite quarters to the jeweler's building, arrived simultaneously. Grave as was the crisis, as their eyes met and they clasped hands, they burst into a laugh. This outdistanced even their experience. "'Picked up anybody?' asked Dunstan. "'I'll wager you haven't nabbed the man who had brains enough to touch off these 1,700 burglar alarms at once.' "'Oh, we've got the usual riff-raft,' said Burns. "'Some bums, a couple of scrub women, a handful of firemen from the big buildings, and so on. It's hard on them, but it can't be helped. The only thing promising was one man who had a reporter's card, but he bluffed the lieutenant and got through the lines. "'Well, Captain,' said the deputy, turning to one of his men, "'what is it? Where did they spring the trap?' The police captain saluted and led the way to the second floor of the building. This entire floor was occupied by Ludwig Telfen. If you are fortunate enough to possess an ornament enclosing jewels of something finer than usual water, the chances are that if you take a sharp glass and look on the reverse side, you will find a little mark formed by the looping together of the capitals L and T. And you can rest assured that if Ludwig Telfen made the setting, the gems it encloses are worth far more than the gold that clasps them no matter how exquisite the setting, no matter if Benvenito himself made the design. Ludwig Telfen once came into prominence by his refusal to assemble a certain famous brooch of pearls that had paid $100,000 in customs duties on the ground that they were imitations. He, of a dozen jewelers and experts, was the only one to discern the fraud. Phew! All Telfen, eh? That's bad as a starter, exclaimed Burns under his breath. The main entrance to the suite occupied by Telfin stood open. A new light as to the daring of this deed burst on Burns, used to shocks as he was. "'Rough work, that,' he said, turning to Dunstan. "'What was the exact hour the first switchboard went off?' Two forty-five to the second. "'Hell broke loose. I was asleep upstairs. I thought the roof had caved in. Then came the second and the third. Seventeen hundred and fifty-six all at once. I never expect to hear a record like that again.' Seventeen hundred and fifty-six chances to one, said Burns, and they proceeded, examining every step of the way. Here a door was battered, there a litter of glass on the floor, with nearly eighteen hundred strong boxes within a radius of half a mile shrieking burglars. The master thief had gone straight to the mark. There was no mistaking the mark. It stood in the middle of a great room, the famous safe of Ludwig Telfen. The grating about it was crumpled like cloth. This safe has been described so many times in the press that it is worth only a line here. Not content with Harveyized steel, the makers constructed an envelope of armored concrete eighteen inches thick on all four sides. The safe stood in the middle of the room like a four-square tomb in its cathedral crypt. Even after the wonderfully ingenious locks had been manipulated, a section of the floor must be lowered before the door could be opened. That section of flooring, solid concrete, was lowered now. It lay six inches below the surrounding level. Burns sprang forward with a cry of amazement. He seized the pilot wheel and whirled it. The great door of the safe swung silently open like some animate thing, and the darkness of the interior yawned on the tense little party. Burns turned with a queer gesture. The gesture said, It's all over. When the door, once started on its half-revolution, touched a certain angle, an electric contact was made, and the interior suddenly glowed with scores of incandescent lights. On the floor lay a crude-appearing mechanism, consisting of two unusually long carbon rods bound together, though insulated from each other, and connected with an electric transformer such as is used in welding. On the floor, too, were scores of crumpled envelopes, all empty. Metal doors that lined the walls of the interior hung slatternly on rudely twisted hinges, disclosing metal boxes, empty. Burns himself, matter of fact, unromantic, stirred more easily by deeds than by poetic suggestion, found himself trying to decipher the symbols with which the empty envelopes were penciled. Each symbol held its story of treasures of gold and gems, men's greed, women's vanity and tears. How much was gone? How much remained? Only old Telfin himself, with shrewd, pasty mask of a face, 
with its high, thin nose and lips as thin as a slit in ivory, only old Telford himself could tell. But the thief, what a thief! On the floor, carefully laid aside, was the ransom of a king. Rare designs and special metals, fragile baskets woven of threads of gold as fine as silk, wreaths of stubborn platinum worked with infinite patience and skill into little nests to receive their precious jewels, the almost medieval trappings designed for the oratory of the wife of a multimillionaire. These, magnificent in themselves, were thrust aside, ignored as dross, for the masterpieces the famous vault contained. While eighteen hundred bells were shrieking, crying in terror, while cordons of police were being thrown about so that even a crawling animal could not escape, while guardians of the mammoth treasure were rushing frantically about, seeking the thousand thieves in one, or the one thief in a thousand, this master rogue had with unerring hand cracked the biggest prize in the city, and with the coolness of a connoisseur had tested, weighed, and rejected, and taken his fill. Then Ludwig Telford himself came, white and terrible to behold. Burns established field headquarters on the spot, and his lieutenants were coming and going with his tense commands. He reinforced the lines around the desolated blocks until in police parlance the four streets that held the cordon together were one continuous circle of peg posts. But no one realized more than Burns himself the futility of such a course. He tightened the lines merely because it was the obvious thing to do. There was one chance in a thousand that the bird had not yet flown. Newspaper men were assaulting the lines on all sides, but all for no purpose. There was no juice in the turnip for them. Extras were flooding the streets. Throngs were hurrying downtown by every line of cars, surging against the impregnable police wall by thousands. But the best they could get in the way of information was the fact that nearly two thousand burglar alarms had gone off at the same moment and left uncovered the richest camp in the world, measured in terms of gold and gems. That the reserves of the whole island had now been summoned to hold the impregnable wall was in itself a drug that fed the popular imagination beyond the heights of reason, a mechanical system fairly devilish in its ingenuity, invulnerable beyond its double and redoubled lines of defense, had been swept away by a single stroke as a tornado levels a plain or a flood engulfs a valley. Bankers, brokers, merchants, jewelers, goldsmiths, the aristocracy of wealth and trade that hives in this quarter in the daylight hours and draws on the world for capital, rush to the scene, frantically importunate, hurling themselves against that stubborn line that knew no orders except from one source, the huge silent man with square jaws, square mustache, and square shoes, who was sitting in the offices of Ludwig Telfen, examining a set of powerful bloom shears that had been found in a manhole in Nassau Street. The blades of this set of shears had a cutting strength of thousands of pounds. A child executing gentle pressure on the powerful lever could slice a great piece of metal in twain as if it were sausage. The emergency crew of the protective system had discovered the spot where the cables had been rent asunder early in the excitement, with their charts showing the location of every trunk of the monster nerve system of burglar protection, they had followed up the main cables manhole by manhole until they finally came to the corrugated cover on which the fat man in goggles had rested himself to get a view of the astronomical inaccuracies of the inside of his car. The manhole was a roomy affair. It had to be to accommodate men working at the cables, which are tested regularly with the finest instruments known to science. The expert who had cut the cables had evidently spent some time awaiting the mystic hour. A dozen cigarette butts scattered about the cement well showed that he had awaited the appointed second without impatience, and having accomplished his task, he had left this set of bloom shears behind as a clue, whatever that might be worth, and had gone to the trouble of putting the manhole cover back in its seat with some care. He had probably escaped by Broadway. That meant running a hundred yards before the first section of the police cordon could be summoned. The blades of the shears were covered with a coating of lead and copper like a film of grease. There was a calm, cool insolence about the whole thing that got on Burns' nerves. A bureau of identification was established at eight o'clock for the clamoring bankers and jewelers. Every mother's son of them had to be identified before he could enter the lines, and then he entered under guard and opened his safes under guard. One by one the treasure vaults were checked off as their contents were found to be intact. As the vaults were surrendered to their owners, the guard would move on to the next and the next. 
It was not until noon that the inventory had been made throughout the district. Of all the district, only the strong room, the fabled strong room of Ludwig Telfen, had been tapped. The genius of the night, then, had jammed the entire machinery of the street and the lane, rousted it from its bed with shrieking clamors for the police, simply for the opportunity of attacking this one prize. The white-faced Telfin, inscrutable even in this hour, deciphered the stories of the empty envelopes one by one. It was at ten o'clock when he crumpled up and was carried away. The Bentori crucifix was gone, with its one matchless sapphire. The Dalgoda Pearl, the Great Canary Diamond, the Diamond of the Safarans family, with its creepy history. A Hindustani ruby called the Well, a pale blue hyacinth, on whose broad table had been carved a symbol that had baffled the greatest archaeologists. And a baker's dozen of unset diamonds, carefully matched as to size and color. Not a thief, merely. An artist had picked here. The strong room of Ludwig Telfen, as we have said, stood in the middle of the room like a tomb in a crypt with its sheathing of concrete. It was like a monolith the size of a dozen elephants. A workman with the coldest drawn chisel would laugh at an order to drill through the adamant in an eight-hour day. Yet a hole the size of a man's thigh penetrated the mass, leading straight and true to the very heart of the ingenious mechanism hidden within, a mechanism in itself believed to be indestructible. It was not indestructible. The same brain that had known the spot to tap the monolith, and then had devised the means of tapping it, had played with the safe as though it had been a toy instead of a thing hundreds of men of talent had made their life work. A pellet of some explosive at the right spot had destroyed the spark of life, and once destroyed, the mechanism of the doors, as beautiful as the inside of a watch, became merely a jumble of senseless cogs. "'Can you figure it?' asked Burns, inspecting the huge hole in the monolith. "'It's beyond me, I must admit.' "'I don't know,' said Dunstan, "'but I'm going to find out.' He connected the set of carbon rods to the electric switch panel in the corridor through a transformer. "'If I figure it right,' he said, "'there are a thousand amperes of electricity flowing through these rods when the current is turned on. One-tenth of an ampere will kill a man under certain conditions. Look at this.' He kicked the switch with his foot and instantly a blue-white flame, an arc of blinding intensity, shot across the gap between the ends of the carbon rods, hissing ominously. He handled the rods with his bare hands. Harmless as a kitten, he said as Burns cried out in dismay. He held the hissing arc against the side of the vault. The cement seemed to shrink before it and melt. It dissolved into a fine dust that hung in the air. They tell us that that concrete will withstand any fire. It did in San Francisco. Look at that! Concrete will stand two thousand degrees of heat, but it won't stand this heat. Burns, he cried, sobered, as he kicked over the switch and dropped the electric torch. When they come this good, we can't beat them. We just haven't got the brains. That's all there is to it. 3. Captain Hapenny, that blue-eyed son of Yorkshire who patrolled the waters of Raritan Bay at night, to locate the universities of fish for his customers in daytime, waited long and finally impatiently at the musty Huguenot's wharf that memorable morning for policeman 004. Finally he gave up and went out to his lobster pots. As for officer 004, he dozed away the morning on his peg post in Fulton Street, dimly conscious that a cataclysm had occurred in his immediate neighborhood, of such proportions as to rouse that hard-sleeping locality for once in its life. On the whole, it pleased him to consider that there were rabbits in this graveyard after all. Such a scurrying he had never seen before in his short period as patrolman of the first grade. Shortly after noon the order came to break ranks, and the mystic cordon, the wonder of a gaping crowd, dissolved into thin air and was gone. Our officer purchased a copy of the press and verified his fears that high tide was due off the hook at 11.33 a.m., which meant that the only promise his disrupted day off now held for him was to take all his clothes off, go to bed, and luxuriate in sleep. So he wended his way slowly to the old slip station. The surroundings were beginning to take on their usual air. The rattle of trucks and the odor of fish from the Fulton Market filled the senses. A shock awaited him. As he ascended the steps and clumped across the floor to report himself out at the desk, 
The fragrance of cigar smoke smote his nostrils. His captain, bleary-eyed with his unusual exertions, was leaning back in his big chair, his feet cocked on the corner of the desk, and he was pulling at a cigar, painting the atmosphere with spirals of smoke, as if he had at last found the solace he read about in books. It was not the undignified sight of his captain, with feet higher than his head, that roused the dull mind of Policeman 004. It was the band of the cigar. The band was a brilliant red and blue. The policeman scratched his head and churned his memory. He was painfully extracting a swollen foot from a shoe when light broke on him. It was as clear as day now. That was his cigar. He distinctly remembered the band. A kind, though not over-sociable, gentleman in a stalled automobile had presented him with that cigar earlier in the morning, in fact had presented him with two of them, one for his brother, and this low-life captain had cribbed them out of his helmet while Officer 004 stared vacantly at a spider constructing an engineering work at a window pane with a skill beyond human. He slowly pushed his suffering foot back into a shoe and, his head traveling like a Coney Island merry-go-round, he bent over and absent-mindedly began fastening the laces. He shook himself as though in a cold draft. He bit off part of a fingernail. Mulligan, he said, addressing a man packing a kit on the opposite side of the room. Did I hear you was set down already? The devil take him, said Mulligan between his teeth, and all because somebody tampered with a manhole on me post when I was at the other end of the beat. "'What's the force coming to these days?' I ask. "'It'll cost me ten days' pay at least, mind you.' Officer 004, somewhat dazed, passed out. At the corner of Nassau and Maiden Lane, he found a crowd collected about the very manhole his friend of the night before had selected with so much care as the spot on which to lie down. A pot of wiping solder, looking blue and cool, was thoughtfully bubbling over a gasoline torch and the manhole, now open, was filled with men in jeans, plumbers, thought our officer, like bees in a bee-trap. Officer 004, mouth open, like a sucker drinking in air at the top of a weedy pool of water, listened to the man on post explain the lay of the land. Then he put his hands in his trousers' pockets, in defiance of the rules and regulations, and started east. At Dutch Street he picked out the manufacturing jeweler's building, and on the second floor, after considerable embarrassment, he found Deputy Burns. Officer 004 was not exactly a word artist. More especially, he was not a word artist when on the carpet under the eye of this particular superior, who had a distressing way of looking at him. Herkimer, 1907 model, repeated the deputy. Very good. Report to Farley at headquarters. I'll see you there. Now, there are a hundred thousand automobiles in the city and vicinity of New York. The horsepower, make, and ownership of each is a matter of record. All that is required is infinite patience, or a superfluity of clerks among whom to divide impatience. The Herkimer of the vintage of 1907 was a limited edition that was called in shortly after being put out. A few still crept wearily about the city as though tired of life and its attending ills. At three o'clock that afternoon, an automobile drew up to the entrance of headquarters, then in Mulberry Street. It was a Herkimer, model 1907. Two detectives, undoubtedly detectives from the closely shaved and shiny appearance, helped out a man of middle age, somewhat gray, pasty, and frightened. He was chewing on a cigar that sported a red and blue band. As he got down, a messenger boy on a bicycle rushed up, dropping his wheel with a clatter, and seizing the prisoner, there was no doubt he was such, by the sleeve, he thrust an envelope into his hand. Mr. Merwin! gasped the boy. I have been chasing you all the way down. Had he not been so badly upset, Mr. Merwin might have been astonished. As it was, he stared stupidly from the envelope to the messenger boy, and thence to the cloud of reporters the detectives were beating back. He was hurried to the office of the deputy commissioner. Burns wheeled in his chair. Merwin! Aye, aye! ejaculated the usually collected deputy. What the deuce are you doing in this mess? From the expression on Merwin's face, he himself was still struggling for an explanation why two detectives had gently but firmly insisted on his driving them to headquarters just because he happened to own a Herkimer, reconstructed, 1907. Burns turned to the others with a nod of dismissal. Then he turned on Merwin. He could not bring himself to believe that this notorious crank, 
This nuisance, who had made himself the bane of police administrations for the last ten years, could have a guilty knowledge of the catastrophe of the morning. Yet he shut his teeth down hard, glared at the trembling yet defiant figure before him, and cried out fiercely, Well, out with it, quick! There was something in the attack of Burns that turned the average man inside out. The effect on Merwin, the crank, was peculiar. Merwin suddenly straightened up. He crushed the envelope he held and waved his hands on high. His eyes blazed. I have proved it, he cried triumphantly. The whole town is laughing at you. Burglar protection, bah! One, two, three, I slice your cables, yes. A child could have done it. I have exploded your system, ha ha! Burns sprang at him with the roar of an animal. He seized the man in his grasp and hurled him against a wall. You and your damned patents that have made you a pest for ten years, he cried. Don't start that on me. Come down to earth. Who told you to do it? Who walked through Ludwig Telfin's strong room and took his pick of what he found there while you were chopping the cables with your infernal shears? Spit it out. Who was it? Quick. The infuriated deputy dropped the man and backed away from him. Telfin? Strong room? Took his pick? Why, man, it was to be a joke, a jest. I am. I am a genius. I needed only this to prove my system. Telfin, did you say? He, 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 yes, he. Who was he? The inventor, who for years had striven by every means known to insane persistence to foist his worthless electrical protective system on the city, gradually collected his senses. Burns got the story of the Duke piecemeal. It seemed that Merwin had encountered an engaging young dandy on a recent weekend visit to Atlantic City. This person had seemed particularly interested in, though politely skeptical of, Merwin's pet theories as to the weakness of the protective system in vogue in the large cities. So skeptical indeed was he that their somewhat heated argument had ended in a wager, a stake of one thousand dollars, that Merwin, by the simple means he had described, could not, at a given hour, on a given night, render the treasure vaults of the city of New York or de Cambon. They had settled the hour then and there. The electrician was smiling like a child when he ended them. I have showed them up. I have showed them up, he cried, his insane pride getting the better of him again. With one stroke I have proved to this great city that its fancied security is as thin as— No more of that. We've something more serious on just now than rival systems. You cut the cables, you admit. I did. I certainly did. That's my set of bloom shears on your desk now. This young man was a genius. There was no other way to show you. My brother took me down to Nassau Street, and we waited until the cops changed post. Lord, I know the plan of their mains like I know the humps in my own bed. Simple? Why, as the showing up of the egregious asinine— In his excitement he tore apart the envelope he was crushing in his hands. Two halves or a thousand-dollar bill dropped out. The wager! The wager! He saw it! He's paid it! cried Merwin. The thief! cried Burns. On a slip of paper with a bill was the line, typewritten, My compliments. You have convinced me. Seeking the engaging young man who had made the estimable, though fanatical, electrician his easy dupe in the matter of looting the Ludwig Telfin strong room, Burns paid a visit to the address indicated in the enclosure. Needless to say, however, neither the name nor the description the electrician furnished was recognized by the respectable landlady who answered the bell. So ended the incident of the Night of the Thousand Thieves, the feat taking its place among the many unsolved mysteries. There were clues, it is true, but they were too insolently obvious on the face to lead anywhere. The misguided inventor passed the remainder of his days in confinement, childishly happy at having achieved his life's ambition. It is interesting to note, in passing, that of the rare gems so carefully selected from the Telfin strong room that morning, only one was ever traced. The story has never been verified. It is a myth. At the head of navigation on the Sanguiny River rests a little chapel built by fishermen. On the cliffs above stands the figure of a virgin, the thanks offering of those saved from the sea. The lost Bentori crucifix is said to hang in the chapel. It is mentioned, merely as a coincidence, that the exquisite Godal, a famous cosmopolite, the infallible Godal, whose true character was never known until the publication of the memoirs of this master rogue, was once rescued from drowning at this spot. End of the Night of a Thousand Thieves
Chapter 4 of Adventures of the Infallible Godal by Frederick Irving Anderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Counterpoint 1. Aside from the fact that one Mr. Jackson of Cleveland had further fattened his batting average by lifting a ball over the ridge pole of the Polo Grounds Clubhouse, a stupendous feat in the dog days, there was nothing in the morning papers to excuse the waste of ink and paper incident to the running off of an edition. Everybody was out of town, and, as usual, news had followed the crowd. The serialized comics and other faithful all-the-year-round performers were still active in their respective columns. A variety actress was having herself arrested in Asbury for wearing a one-piece bathing suit. An entire Jersey jury was being hung by its twelfth member, who did not believe in capital punishment. And the crafty Japanese were realistically credited with sewing the gates of the Gatun locks with rhyolite, cordite, maximite, etc., so that at the psychological moment, and as a diplomatic declaration of war, a samurai in the disguise of a barber could press a button and leave the major portion of our fleet of super-dreadnoughts stranded up to its knees in the mud of the lake. Godal, the infallible Godal, languidly pushed aside his breakfast things and ran through his morning papers. He was pleased to note that only the most enterprising of the morning papers contained the item divulging the secret of the Gatun locks, being built of fulminating compounds instead of concrete, as was popularly supposed, the contemporaries remaining silent on this delicate subject. Godal tossed the paper to an adjoining table, where breakfasting late, like himself, sat his friend of many capitals, Adichie Yakisakwa, or Yakisakwa Adichie, as you will. I see you are up to your old tricks again, Adichie, said Godal genially. The little Japanese looked uncertainly from the paper to Godal and back again several times. He could not quite make out, when Occidentals addressed him, whether or not they were in earnest. Most of them treated him as a joke. Adichie was not a joke. He was traveling round the world slowly, so slowly indeed, that when he reached home again he would be very wise and very old. In Germany he made wooden toys. In France he was a banker. In England he sold silks. And in America he wrote for the press. At home, Yasakawa Adichi was something we do not comprehend. Here he was trying his best to be an American, if we would only let him, which we would not. Ha ha! said Adichie, still somewhat uncertain. Godal, whom he had known in Berlin, Paris, and London, had never treated him as a monkey. But Godal always had this habit of eyeing him sharply, which was fully as disconcerting. Adichie had a tinkling little voice. Of all his features, only his square, shiny teeth expressed the mirth that this exclamation implied. He looked at Godal several times to ascertain if that person wished to enter into a conversation, but Godal was again immersed in a newspaper, this time an early extra of an afternoon edition which the waiter had just brought him. So Adichie resumed his task, which was the making of embroidery designs on a piece of paper, the writing of his father's, a system of shorthand much older than the family tree of Ben Pittman himself. Adichie could handle a typewriter with any reporter but he could think best in his own pothooks. Now he was transcribing music from the do-re-mi fa sol of accepted usage into fantastic ideographs. Godal, who watched the curious little globe-trotter in the tiny mirror made by the planes of his eyeglasses, was candidly interested, as he was in everything Adichie did. Suddenly, however, Godal's wandering attention was recalled to his afternoon extra, he brought himself back to the immediate cause of his being in town this torrid weather. Stock exchange news was on the front page. At the opening of the session at ten o'clock that morning, the bears had raided Little Steel, knocking the stilts from under that restless disturber of Wall Street traffic, just at a moment when a board of directors thought they had everything tacked down tight and had gone to sea. This was good news, indeed. Not because it was Little Steel that was again playing all three rings of the circus, but because there was transpiring a movement in stocks of sufficient importance to break into the front page of the newspapers. Godal had been waiting patiently for Wall Street news to break into the first page for months now. In five minutes he was in his own runabout, a high-powered car that breathed as easily as an engine coasting downhill. 
He stepped down into Cedar Street ten minutes later and turned the key in his magneto switch so that he might find the car when he returned. It was quite probable that he would be in a hurry when he returned. Next he tossed his silk cap with his gauntlets into the dust-tight compartment behind and donned a shiny silk hat. The silk hat was his badge for this occasion. He turned the corner, swinging along with a free gait which he had acquired in his earlier youth only after arduous toil with a fencing master of repute. The curb market, sprawling over the asphalt in front of the stock exchange, was bubbling like drops of water on a hot griddle. Everyone seemed in a hurry or else trying to out-talk someone else. The only exceptions to the turmoil were the decrepit nags attached to obsolete hansoms roped into line in the middle of the street and the occasional coming and going of well-fed persons clad in silk hats and frock coats who exuded an air of prosperity and respectability. Both the exceptions, the horses munching at their nosebags and the silk hat brigade, were of interest to Godal, the horses because of the vegetating life they pursued. These creatures came to Wall Street every day and stood there as long as the exchanges were open. None of them was ever known to carry a passenger since the days of automobiles. The bucolic idea of a stockbroker invariably associates him with a handsome cab, and probably these cabs were retained to preserve local color. Some of the nags stood with crossed legs like make-believe horses one sees in summer vaudeville. Some of them hitched one bony hip high in the air. Others slept through the turmoil, their noses sweeping the ground. All the cabbies looked as if Phil May had drawn them years and years ago. It was the human animal in Godal that caused him to prize these cab horses as one of the sights of the town. It was his thieving propensities, his adventuring genius, that caused him to be interested in the Silk Hat Brigade. These latter were the uptown bargain hunters, who never came to Wall Street unless financial news on the first page informs them that the street operators are either over-anxious to sell or over-anxious to buy. They were not gamblers in stocks, they were investors. They merely took advantage of the periodic myopia from which Wall Street suffers, and they were content with a modest hundred percentum on the dollar in the course of a twelve-month. Godall entered the mahogany offices, entitled in large gold letters, Sturgis, Wheelock, and Company, Stocks and Bonds, and returning the nod of an acquaintance here and there, he dropped into a remote chair dividing his attention between the quotation board and the mob clustering like flies about the chattering ticker. Wall Street Tipple was not to his liking. He was not here to play, even though the cards lay on the table face up. Nevertheless, he was pleased to note that Little Steel was still falling relentlessly and that its sister shares were following it down somewhat like a flock of kingbirds at the tail of a swooping hawk. A second extra edition had just exploded in the street. The riot in stocks occupied the front page. Money kings were rushing to the city by special train. Magnates at sea were clamorously demanding monopoly of the air for the space of the precious minute. A red ink fudge, last-minute news chiseled into the stereotypes just as the presses are ready to start, recorded new low levels of prices of standard industrials and railroads. Someone was being thrown overboard. Who it might be did not interest Godal who glanced up from a swift perusal of the paper and murmured, This should bring him in. The hour was striking noon when Wellington Mapes entered the boardroom. He, too, was buttoned in a frock coat and wore a silk hat in defiance of the sticky humidity. To look at him now, with his wrinkled visage and tottering gait, one would not suspect that in his prime, not a dozen years gone, Governments of the world considered it well worth the cost to tell off shrewd agents to report his smallest doings. It was said in those days that he had an organization extending into every corner of the earth, and that he carried a full line of presidents, cabinets, and royal heirs, ready to be seated or dispatched at a day's notice. That was before age had drawn his fangs. That was before he hid himself from his closest intimates in a seclusion none could penetrate. Though he still maintained an official residence, his real home was as unguessed as the riddle of the Sphinx. Only on feast days in Wall Street did he emerge to play with funds that came from the four winds. This was the man that Godall awaited, this man who had so far outlived his time that most men had forgotten him. Godall would run the old fox to his lair today, that he had promised himself. 
Mapes was a striking figure still at eighty-odd, tall and gaunt, with the beak of an eagle and shaggy brows. One eye was glass, supplanting an orb that had been gouged out by a melee crease. In his funereal attire he looked as soft and flabby as a superannuated deacon. But for all his years he was still a man of thews. His hands were enormous. The thumb of his right hand was a full half-inch longer than its fellow, and no thicker than a cigar. It was encircled with a cicatrix, as regular as a made ring. Years ago a Mongolian bandit with an exalted idea of justice and authority had suspended the two hundred pounds of bone and sinew of Wellington Mapes by the end of that thumb. Mapes soon concluded his business. Like a gambler playing an immutable system, he had his tallies chalked and ready for the occasion. He wrote his check with the first two fingers of the right hand, his useless thumb trailing along behind. His eyes burned an inquiring path among the faces clustering about the ticker. Only two or three of these men were sufficiently alive to externals to note the old fox and nudge each other as he passed. The old man tottered to the door and helped himself down the flight of marble steps leading to the pavement by means of the substantial brass railing. Godall watched him covertly through the broad window screened with a fine copper mesh like watered silk. On the last step Mapes paused and looked up and down the street. Then a miracle occurred. The old man summoned a hansom. Either, thought Godall paradoxically, he sought to attract attention or to avoid it. Possibly again paradoxically, he sought to accomplish the one by means of the other. The cabby at the head of the slovenly line rubbed his eyes and his nose, and it required the services of a friendly messenger boy to interpret the old man shaking a menacing cane. The driver yanked the chain that upset the third leg of his hansom. He chirruped to his horse, and the beast came to life with a start and a shudder. The cab drew up at the curb. The old man permitted the porter in waiting to assist him to his seat, and the cab drove off without spoken directions. They would be delivered en route, no doubt. Godall rapidly put in a small order at the desk, and he blotted his check with the self-same blotter which bore the reversed facsimile of the palsied signature of Wellington Mapes. He turned it over. The inscription ran, Forty-four thousand three hun. Then it was lost in a maze of confusing numerals. It was some forty-five minutes later that the head of the somnolent line of cab horses drew up at a corner in Lower Seventh Avenue that might have been the backdrop of a ten, twenty, and thirty-cent melodrama. The house was an old rookery of wood, tumbling into decay. A tailor sign decorated one dusty window, and round the corner a device rusty with age related to the passerby that in the heyday of its prosperity the rookery had housed a carpenter named Jones. At the apex of the building, the house formed a triangle fenced in by an intersecting street and avenue, was a gaudy barber pole, ceaselessly churning an endless screw of red and white to advertise the industry within. In front of the barber shop, trespassing on the pavement, stood an old ailanthus tree in the act of shedding the shreds of its effugent blossoms. Under the tree were playing a group of dirty children. Against the tree were lounging a young man who might be a plumber, to judge by the kit of tools that lay at his feet, and streaks of plumbago that decorated his face. Behind this soiled mask looked out the keenest eyes in all New York, those of the exquisite Godall. Godall had made a quick change from his faultless walking attire to anticipate, for the second time in three months, the coming of Wellington Mapes to this down-at-heels neighborhood. On the previous occasion, when Wall Street news broke into a first-page column and lured Wellington Mapes from his retreat long enough to invest in marked-down goods in Broad Street, he had made his way, then in a taxicab, to this sequestered barber shop, with Godall running a warm scent. But the man the master thief had followed away half an hour later proved, in the end, to have two good eyes in his head and a perfect thumb on his right hand though in all other respects he was Wellington Mapes to the life. Apparently on that occasion the old world adventurer had caused to employ a double. Mapes now alighted feebly and walked across the sidewalk to the door, which opened for him from within. It was only a brief wait. Everything occurred as it had occurred in the former instance. The door opened again, and a white-coated barber assisted the old man who emerged to the waiting hansom. 
Again, it was Wellington Mapes to the life, except, as the apparently drowsing plumber noted under his lashes, both eyes were busy covertly examining the street in all directions, and one glimpse he got of the right hand told Godall that all its members were intact. Godall smiled discreetly to himself. It was so simple if one only used his wits. The cab started off. As it rounded the corner, a second cab, another cab of the Wall Street vintage, appeared quite accidentally from Greenwich Avenue, turning north onto 7th Avenue in the wake of the first. And shortly, an automobile that had been standing at the curb opposite began to churn and rolled off leisurely up the avenue. Godall was not the only one interested in the movements of Wellington Mapes on this day. It was a full half hour later that a tottering figure, muffled to the eyes, emerged from the barber shop, and as if by magic, a taxicab rolled up to the curb and was off with the old man as quick as a flash. I am with you this time, my fine friend said Godall to himself, and when the second taxicab was halted at 23rd Street by the cross-town tide of traffic, an exceedingly dirty plumber with a high-powered runabout of splendid appointments was next in line. 2. The house was old, yet it retained in its grim signs of age every touch of its pristine magnificence. It occupied a park of probably three acres overlooking the river. A bluff overhung and concealed the tracks of a railroad running beside the placid Hudson. Hemming in the place on three sides were the towering lights of encroaching apartment houses. On the river front, for blocks, the entire slope was a net of paved streets flanked by magnificent structures of terracotta and brick. Only this sequestered square, its lawn overgrown, its shrubbery running riot, and its fences falling to decay, suggested the glories of old Washington Heights and revolutionary days, before the city had traveled north. Over the ridge on the other side of the hill were the thirteen trees Alexander Hamilton himself planted as symbols of the units of the young nation. Ten minutes' walk to the north, overlooking the Harlem River from the heights, was the historic mansion where first the British, then the colonial officers had gathered about the mahogany and planned their scheme of battle. The house stood four square in its little park. It was of three stories, surmounted by a mansard roof. A veranda clung to its river face, one end sagging under the rotting timbers laid more than a century ago. Godall had chosen a rear window on the first floor, after a painstaking reconnaissance of the situation. His blood tingled. It was rarely that he indulged in an adventure of breaking and entering, and then only for high stakes, as now. But tonight there was an added zest in the affair. Mapes had been a roaring lion in his day, and to tamper with him and his possessions at his zenith would have been to invite certain destruction. All this had changed now with the coming of age, and when Godall had set forth airily on this adventure he had not anticipated entering a web. Yet two vehicles do not dog a fictitious person without reason, and Godall, as he worked, could not help wondering if he alone had been successful in picking up the right trail. The mere fact that the crafty old man had, on at least two occasions, taken such pains to cover his tracks, after an open appearance in Wall Street, gave rise to a thousand speculations. It was simple enough for a man of Godall's talents. The French window gave easily and noiselessly. Godall found himself in a broad room that seemed long unused. Through an open door he caught the sound of tinkling silver. Mapes was at dinner. If Godall's information was correct, the old man was attended by but one servant. That servant would now be engaged in caring for his master's wants at table, and the light-footed thief moved forward in the gloom and lifted a dusty tapestry leading to the adjoining library. A low light was burning there, and the window curtains were drawn tight. It had the familiar pleasant smell of tenancy. In one corner it was a closed desk. Adjoining it was a small safe let into the wall. In the center, under a hanging gas lamp, was a table piled with books and odds and ends. A tray with a decanter of liquor and a half-emptied glass stood invitingly in the center. Several loose sheets of paper lay on the table, one held down by a pen, still wet. It was, as he had learned, the man with a soul seared by avarice, extending over an active life of more than fifty years, had developed one queer trait of character in his declining days. This was his infatuation for music. 
Mapes had picked up and reduced to Occidental scoring the weird chants of some eastern tribes he had encountered in his wanderings. There had been no principality too mean for this famous meddler to pry into its secrets. And out of his adventurous past, all he now retained was the memory of those mystic chants whose significance stretched back thousands of years. It was said that the old man toiled unceasingly, setting these airs down on paper. Apparently he had been bent over his task within a few hours, for a sheet of music scores, each inscribed in a trembling hand with fragments of impossible themes, lay on the blotter. Godal picked up one of them and ran over the air in his head. But he was not here through interest in exotic melody. He sought something else, yet he was willing to take advantage of what seemed an old man's abstraction in a hobby, if by its means he could accomplish his own ends. The sound of a heavy chair scraping over a harsh floor brought Godal to a sense of the immediate present. Softly he slipped behind a velvet hanging and waited. It would be a long wait, but the task was worthy of the pains. Wellington Mapes entered, the servant following at his heels and turning on the lights. The room was so heavily curtained that even the brilliant stare of the chandelier could not be seen from the outside. The servant withdrew immediately, and, as he passed through the door, the old man took a key from his pocket and closed and locked it. He would be alone. Godal's flesh tingled again. The success of his venture largely depended on the next act of Wellington Mapes. Godal's task would not permit him to work under the protection of sleep. He must drug the old man's senses deeper than such surface somnolence as a constitution of eighty vigorous years can call upon for solace. Mapes seated himself in his easy chair at the table and for several moments gazed abstractedly ahead of him. Finally, he roused himself and methodically lifted a brass salver from the desk and placed it carefully on the floor beside his chair. He next took up a bunch of keys that lay beside him, rested his left arm on the arm of the chair so that the keys hung over the brass salver and let his head fall back. It was true, then. Wellington Mapes still indulged this unique habit in his old age. In his early days, Wellington Mapes had reduced the science of sleep to elementals, to lose himself in sleep until the muscles of his fingers relaxed and let fall the keys in the resounding salver, ensuring an instant awakening, was all the rest he required to refresh himself for hours of toil. He had learned the trick from a famous physician, and thenceforth had practiced it as sedulously as the great specialist himself. The old man's breathing became more and more regular. Godall crossed the room with padded steps, watching the keys with fascinated eyes. Suddenly the fingers relaxed and the keys fell, but the resounding crash of their contact with the resonant brass did not follow. They fell softly into the waiting hand of the intruder. Godall straightened up with a smile and regarded the keys in his palm. The old man was his prisoner, for the moment at least, as securely as if bound by chains. Godal knelt softly beside the recumbent form and gently touched the loose flesh of the throat with a thumb and forefinger. With a touch as soft as running water, he exerted pressure on the throbbing carotid arteries. Consciousness would not return to that numbed brain until the blood was again permitted to resume its course. It was a trick Godal had acquired in Java, where it is frequently used. To this device of the ancient Javanese, he added another of the moderns. He took from a pocket with his free hand a band of soft rubber, and as carelessly as if he operated on a patient under ether, he proceeded to stretch this over the gray head resting on the cushions. He brought it down to the neck, tightened it, adjusted two soft molds of rubber in the place of his pressing fingertips, and stood away, regarding the finished task with satisfaction. Now he might go about his business. First there was the desk. It was a chance, a small chance, but he must be thorough. The lock came with a click, and he stood up and watched and listened. He gave thanks that Wellington Mapes spent his evenings behind locked doors, free from the eyes even of trusted servants. Inside the desk was a litter of letters and memoranda, mostly pertaining to business, business carried on by the means of the cash that came from the four winds. Godal did not seek money. A letter attracted his eye. He picked it up and carried it over to the light. His quick sense of detail told him that the flap had been steamed and carefully resealed. By whom? Not by Wellington Mapes, surely, because the letter was torn open raggedly at the top. 
He examined the second and the third. All bore the same evidence that someone was tampering with the mail of this burned-out creature of many lives. Godall, his curiosity aroused, drew forth an enclosure. It was a torn scrap of paper, some insignificant memoranda relating to a chart of stocks. Gamblers chart stocks in much the way as the Weather Bureau charts the weather, occupied one side. Surely there was nothing in that to repay a prying person the trouble of intercepting a man's mail. Godal, a magician in ciphers, studied the words and the formation of the letters, but he brought his mind away from the task, satisfied that the inscription contained no hidden message. He examined the other side of the paper. At the top it bore the embossed name of Wellington Mapes. It was a sheet of paper the old man had used in his endless scoring of his weird music. There were a dozen bars of wobbly musical notes, which, as Godal mentally ran through them, revealed a jumble of sounds without lilt or rhythm. A second enclosure he found to have been written on a similar sheet, although the whole sheet was intact and without musical inscription. So with a third and a fourth. Some contained fragments of strange chants similar to those lying on the table beside the heavily breathing Wellington Mapes. Each of the communications was signed with the initial R. The thrifty correspondent, whoever he might be, seemed to have made use of Wellington Mapes' waste paper. Thrusting several letters into his pockets for examination at his leisure, Godal put the rest aside and resumed his search. The safe bore an intricate lock, but the fingers of the rogue, schooled to recognize the silent impact of the hidden tumblers, readily conquered the combination. There was something fantastic in the boldness with which he worked, with the sleeping man at his side. From time to time he stopped to listen, but otherwise gave no sign that the situation was perilous. In the safe was a litter of odds and ends, money, papers, and a drawer of foreign coins, another of rudely carved ornaments and decorations in gold, silver, and hard stones, each of them probably with its tale of blood and disaster. Godall gave them hardly a glance. He explored every nook and crevice of the room to no avail. Finally, with infinite caution, he ran his delicate fingers through the clothing of his unconscious victim. But Mapes wore no belt. It might be around his neck, then. Yes, a pouch hung on a thong under the shirt bosom. With hands that trembled ever so little, Godall untied the string that bound the neck of the pouch. His fingers were alive as they searched the recesses. It was here. He drew forth a roughly shaped circlet of zircon. It was large enough for a man's first finger. The characters, microscopic in size, engraved on its surface, were of a language two thousand years dead. Godall took from his own pocket a stone of similar size and shape. To the touch, the two were identical. Yet even his skill had not been equal to the task of counterfeiting the inscription of the original. He placed the substitute in the pouch, and replaced the pouch in the bosom of the unconscious man. The chances were, he thought, that Mapes would not discover the fraud for months, possibly never. Yet the substitute was dross, and the original, which Godall slipped into the back of a capacious watch-case, was a passe-partout, a talisman, a charm, a division of kingship, the mere possession of which, in its long-forgotten day, would have enabled its bearer to pass unquestioned through the sacred places of an ancient empire. Today it was a curio, a mere nothing, yet, to the mind of the man now treasuring it, it was worth the risks of a night not yet ended. Mapes had confiscated the strange object from the effects of a heathen prince whom he had found occasion to make away with in the course of his business. It would be just as well, considered its new owner, if the heirs or assigns of that same prince did not find the magic stone in one's keeping. It was worth possessing at the expense of a great deal of pains for one who was collecting for the sake of art itself. Some day, thought Godall, the British Museum must own it, to treasure it away among its unseen gems and symbols. Only Godall and the British Museum were institutions to value its true worth, and this Wellington Mapes, who carried it in a pouch on his body, waking and sleeping. Godall settled the old man's head comfortably against the cushions, arranging his clothing and posture with great care. So far all was well. It now remained only to escape, and at the same time to unlock the fettered senses of his victim. I am presenting you with thirty minutes of eternal time in exchange for your bauble, he said, nodding familiarly at the sleeping form. 
At your age, one must treasure time beyond rubies. Smiling blithely, he stepped to the tall clock opposite and turned back the hands a half hour. Likewise, he adjusted the hands of the watch of his victim. Standing beside him, Godal measured the distance to the curtain behind which he had taken refuge on entering here. It would take quick work, the type of skill he rejoiced in. With his fingers pressing the arteries whose resumed flow would bring consciousness to the numb brain, he removed the rubber band. With one movement, he tossed the keys into the waiting salver and leaped to his curtain. The sleeper sat up with a start of one suddenly roused. From force of habit, his fingers sought the keys in the salver. For a short space, he sat idle, summoning his lagging senses. Then he drew his chair to the table and resumed his eternal occupation. 3. It was midnight when Godal found the coast clear and left the house behind him. He hugged the ragged picket fence, shadowed by its wild tumble of overgrown shrubs. A person in his attire, with a face well decorated with lead grease, would be given short shrift if found prowling about such a place at this hour of night. He waited patiently at the gate for a full half hour, and then suddenly he straightened up and started down the neglected avenue. At the corner, a man stepped out from the shadow of a tree, stood stock still in front of him, and laughed. Well, my fine jailbird, said the man genially, but with a distressingly businesslike air. Godall peered into the leering features. Even he, alert for every eventuality, was ill-prepared for the surprise the sight of this man's face gave him. Quick as a flash, however, he had flattened one eyebrow and drawn up one corner of his mouth, a trick that transformed his features. His quick wits worked fast. The night's adventures had developed a sudden and amazing illumination. Scott, he exclaimed with a sneer of contempt, you miserable incompetent. I thought we had lost you and your pack of amateurs in Lower Seventh Avenue this afternoon. Marvin Scott was known to the master rogue as a young dandy who did his best to ape Godall, the exquisite, in the clubs he frequented. Of good family, Scott had been advanced in the diplomatic service for several years till his taste for wild escapades had led to his dismissal. So at least the story ran. The unexpected mention of his own name, coming with sneering sarcasm from this soiled person in jeans, carried Scott off his feet, but he quickly recovered himself. Seizing Godall by the shoulders, a fatal move, for the next instant his wrists were in the grip of wire-like fingers, he struggled toward the light. "'Who the devil are you?' he cried, battling furiously. "'I don't know you.' "'You will,' said Godall vehemently. He had taken a long shot, and even now that he felt sure of his ground, he was entirely aware that the infallible Godall was lost if this man recognized him on such a venture. That the house of Wellington Mapes was being watched could mean but one thing. The old fox was at his old games again." He had long held a suspicion that Marvin Scott's long journeys hither and yon about the earth were not wholly unofficial. This thing was as clear as day. The gentleman adventurer could be here in but one capacity, as a secret agent of the State Department. "'You have made a pretty mess of this business,' cried Godall. He released his hold, but he thrust out his chin so savagely that the other, nonplussed at the sudden turn affairs had taken, shrank before him. Do you think I have nothing better to do than to devote my time to your failures? Tell me, who among you had the wit to trace Mapes here after he doubled on you? Tell me that. Take your hand off your gun, Godall commanded, pursuing his advantage. For the other, perplexed in spite of his chagrin at the way this stranger had ridden him down, made a move toward a pocket. The stranger's tone was one of authority. In his trade, no man knows his brother. Follow me, said Godall over his shoulder as he started off. And remember, he said as he waited for the other to overtake him, I am Brown. If you call me anything else in the next half hour, I will see to it you are started to Shanghai on foot. In the cover of the darkness, as they proceeded, Godall indulged in a smile. So young Marvin Scott, in the role of a diplomatic agent, had been assigned to match his wits against the wily old mapes. The situation that had promised to be exceedingly embarrassing was turning out entirely to Godall's liking. His man, who it was plain to see accepted him now in his character of a disgruntled superior, was following along as tamely as if he had been accustomed all his life to take orders from a plumber. They mounted the steep hill to Broadway, and then crossed to Amsterdam Avenue. Godall picked out an all-night saloon and entered the side door. 
the back room was deserted, and he and his companion were soon sitting down and regarding each other with very different emotions. I suppose, said Godall wearily, that if I had let you have your way, you would have further distinguished yourself by picking me up and turning me over to the police as a common housebreaker, eh? The other man said nothing. He was trying to remember where he had seen this face before. If it had not been for the smear of plumbago, as black as lamp black, running parallel to the nose, the task might have been easier. Godall shook his head, a queer smile playing about his lips. The damnable part of it, he went on, in a tone of utter disgust, is that, now that I have finished up another one of your failures, you will get the credit for it, just as you have done in the past. Godall took an envelope out of his pocket, one of the three pilfered from the littered desk of Wellington Mapes. As a piece of fine art, he said, now enjoying the situation to its utmost, I call your attention to this. My man, did you by any chance think that you were playing with a baby when you undertook to scrutinize the mail of Wellington Mapes? A child of five could have done a better job of steaming than that. Scott's eyes bulged at the sight of the letter, which, it was true, had already passed through his hands. All his defenses were now down. He sat silently, watching the dirty and offensively authoritarian person of whom he had had the bad luck to run afoul, as that individual gave his undivided attention to the enclosure of this envelope. The adventure of the night was, after all, a mere bagatelle to Godal. Something infinitely more interesting was on Anne now. He read and reread the words of the letter. They suggested nothing but margins and rights, dividends, and Supreme Court decisions affecting big business. He turned the paper over, and a second time a dazzling illumination stole over his senses. He had begun to discover that two and two make four. There was a decrepit piano in the room. Godall stepped over to it, and holding the paper with its straggling bars of music, he fingered the notes over. "'I suppose that means nothing to you, Mr. Marvin Scott,' he said. Scott shook his head, but a dull red began to burn in his cheeks. A dozen of these letters had passed through his hands, but not until this moment had he thought of attaching any significance to the crazy scores written on the back. "'No, I suppose not,' said the plumber person abstractedly. "'Let me have your pen.' It was then twelve-thirty. At one-thirty, Godall handed Scott a sheet on which he had written the answer to the riddle. It was a cipher, after all. The crafty old mapes had buried it in the music score. It is a bit clumsy, said Godall, but at least it has the advantage of not requiring a written key, and it can be varied at will. The key ran as follows. A equals AA, B equals AB, C equals AC, D equals AD, E equals AE, F equals BA, G equals BB, H equals BC, I equals BD, J equals BE, K equals CA. L equals CB, M equals CC, N equals CD, O equals CE, P equals DA, Q equals DB, R equals DC, S equals DD, T equals DE, U equals EA, V equals EB, W equals EC, X equals ED, Y equals EE. The dazed young man took the paper from Godall's hand. His face was flushed with an intermingling of enthusiasm and chagrin when he looked up. Godall, the soul of indulgence, was beaming on him. "'Reduce your score to letters, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C,' he said. "'The F and the G are blinds, you see,' he said. "'So are the sharps and flats. "'When you come to a chord, disregard all but the dominant note. "'I see I must teach you elementals.' Scott took the letter and set to work feverishly. Soon it was done. "'By gad! Wonderful!' he cried, and he read the translation. "'Flamenco and Naos complete. Perico not later than the fifteenth. "'Flamenco, Naos, and Perico?' Godal rummaged his brain. Those, if he remembered rightly, were the three islands of the Pacific side of the Panama Canal, which the government was fortifying with such secrecy. It beats all, cried the youth, outside of Goethals and the House and Senate Committee on Military Affairs, and possibly the War College. There is not another man alive supposed to know those plans. 
and yet old Mapes, practically dead and buried ten years ago, so far as his ability to meddle is concerned, has walked right into the middle of things with his damnable organization and snitched the plans right out from under our noses. I presume, said Godall, whose mind, working back through a series of pictures, had suddenly found a new inspiration, I presume, seeing you have distinguished yourself so signally on this end of the combination, that you have not the remotest idea who is working the other end. The enthusiasm of the other was suddenly squelched. He blurted out his complete failure. Do you happen to know a smooth little Jap named Adichi Yasakwa? asked Godal. He is taking one hundred years to circumnavigate the globe. Very well, said Scott in surprise. The mildest little creature that ever— Yes, I know. Very mild indeed, retorted Godall sharply. Remember, this is your affair. I am not to be known in it, not even to the chief. Recollect that, or off goes your head at the collarbone. Scott, he said, leaning forward, Yasakwa is interested in music, deeply interested in music. He transcribes it into pothooks of his own. Don't attempt to decipher his pothooks. That would be asking too much of you. But raid his rooms after eleven in the morning, and you will find just what the government of Japan thinks of flamenco, Laos, and Perico. And Scott, he added, looking very dignified and solemn, make it a point not to know me when we meet the next time. I congratulate you on the successful termination of your assignment. I have the honor of wishing you a very good morning. End of Counterpoint